I'm one of the plastic surgeons here, and I have a pretty broad topic to talk about because it's all about facial fractures. So a little bit of a background. Uh, even though we as a tertiary center see, see a lot of fractures and you hear about a lot of fractures, facial fractures in kids are actually not that common. It's about four or five times more common in adults. Therefore, the tendency is for people to treat them not like adults. But they're not just young adults. There are a lot of different things that uh, are different in kids. There are different operative indications. There's this emotional, significant emotional aspect to the facial fracture, the parents' guilt. There's a lot of physiologic differences in children. The anatomy is very different. And we have to count for the growth factor because what they have today might affect this in later, later in their life. Unfortunately, there's a lot of controversy in the literature because there are no great studies except for a few centers in the country that have long-term follow-up for these kids. Because if they do better and they don't have any problems, they'll never come back to see you or me. So in order to talk about epidemiology, uh, we divide the patients in three groups. And that's because it's a very different characteristics from when they're born until teenage years. So the first group is up to five years of age. They have a primary dentition. They're supposed to be supervised. And they're, <laughs> yeah. And their cranial to face ratio is really significant, it's about eight to one, meaning their skull and, and cranium are eight times bigger than their face. Then they go to the second group, which is the school age, six to 12 years of age, and they have mixed dentition. And then you go to the teenage years, they're usually more independent, involved, more involved in sports, and they have the permanent dentition. And they're closer to kind of the adult side, and the adult side in size, and their cranial to face ratio goes down to two to one. And that's important because uh, the most common fracture in kids and in every single age is actually the orbit. So it goes back to Dr. Hurst's uh, uh, importance of the talk. And uh, very significant as well in small kids because again, goes back to that ratio of the cranium and the skull being bigger than the face, much bigger than the face. And in little kids, skull is more prevalent. We see a lot of, mon of the nasal fractures in the clinic, like you probably mentioned, you thought before in the, in the, in the poll, uh, but orbit is very, very common. Then associated injuries, most of them are associated with soft tissue injury, which makes sense, but there's a spe specific neurological component to it, not only intracranial, but also spine. Most of the trauma happens in the outdoors and in younger kids, as I said, up to five years of age, home is a big chunk of it. Too. So in your evaluation, independent where the patient comes, the patient should have an ATLS protocol. This is very simple in the office, right? Because in the ER, we go through the ATLS protocol with like 200 people around the patient. But in the office, your vital signs are important. You just check for airway, you check for breathing, you check for circulation, and that just gives, me a, gives you a good idea. I don't expect this is gonna show up in your office. Um, the history, however, is as important as because you have to know what kind of mechanism. Did the child just fall from standing height? Were they playing with their two-year-old or were they playing with a teenager? Were they in an MVC? Uh, what was happening and how did that trauma happen? And also the importance of the prior, in, if any prior injuries or scars or sequelae that the patient had. So in physical examination, always check when you have facial fracture if there are any missing teeth. You always worry they can swallow a tooth or it's gonna get stuck or they can, they can actually aspirate that tooth. Look for some lacerations and also open fractures. And that's important for, uh, for the need for referral of the patient to the ER or to us. And always look uh, if the patient has any tenderness, if there was a slight little trauma to the face, there was any tenderness in the neck. Three to 5% of the patients that had facial fracture can actually have associated C-spine injury. So if they come to your office walking, and they, but they have a big blow in their face, and they touch their neck, they have a little tenderness in there, they're verbal and everything, put a C collar and send the patient to the, to the ER. Don't, just, don't think that just because they came walking, they, they're, they're fine and can go home. From the diagnostic perspective, CT scan is our, is our biggest standard uh, diagnostic testing. It's much more useful than the x-ray. Actually, we don't even do x-rays anymore. Whatever you can get with x-ray for facial trauma, you can get with your physical examination. So we do have a lot of patients that come with x-rays in their hands, but it really doesn't help as much. If there's a big concern, just order a CT scan. Craniofacial CT scans are actually done a specific way, so it has, order just has to be craniofacial CT because one millimeter cuts, and through the orbit is actually 0.5 because the bones are so, so thin. We usually get the three-day reconstruction, but it's usually for surgical planning. 
So let's say that patient walks into your office and you're worried about something significant. Don't spend time on the x-ray to have the patient be seen, get a CT scan and send it to the office, or if the patient needs this ER evaluation like I'm going to talk about in a little bit. In regards to laceration, it's very brief that I want to say. Some pediatricians that work in urgent care and all that, they actually close lacerations, and I just wanted to uh, uh, emphasize the importance of actually closing them. We usually don't fix bones right away. We wait for that swelling to go down. So covering that soft tissue, especially if the patient is farther from the from big medical center or farther from the evaluation from us, um, it's very important to close the soft tissue so you can protect those bony structures. After you do a, very, a good evaluation of his facial trauma, of his facial nerves, and you block everything, you, and you respect the layers of closure, you can actually get to something like that. So I don't expect you to fix those, but if you have something small that just needs a couple, a couple little uh, sutures, and you have the capability of that, because I know that some of people do in urgent care, just put that, just put it with a little bit of local anesthetic and we're covering things uh, for transfer of the patient or for further evaluation. So then we go to fractures. I'm going to come up with a few cases and I'll give you like 10, 15 seconds to see what you think when your patient comes into your office like this. So this is a 14 year old boy that came to your office. He was actually a baseball. His coach said he's never seen such a high velocity ball. And this kid comes in, he has a little bit of numbness. Uh, around here. He can see it pretty well. This kid has a pretty significant frontal fracture. So yeah, as you can see, it's a very big depression of the anterior table. The anterior table, uh, the frontal sinus develops about seven to eight years of age. And you have an outer table and an inner table. And you can, have, you can, you can actually have them both break or one of them break. So this kid would need, again, a CT scan. He would need to be sent for evaluation of his eyes and he'll need an evaluation by us, even if he doesn't go to the operating room right away. So when we're talking about frontal fractures and cranial base fractures, there's a 75% risk of intracranial injuries. Doesn't mean that they're gonna need neurosurgical intervention all the time, but they have to be evaluated for sure. So it has to be a pretty significant trauma and impact to create this, this kind of trauma like the other kid. And one more very important thing on little kids is the possibility of growing skull fracture, and I will show you a little bit of the picture of that. So what happens when you have a skull fracture, or anything around the brain, you can have an injury not only to the bone, but an underlying injury to the dura. If the dura is torn, the dura is actually what uh, um, makes the regeneration of the bone. It's actually it's what uh, makes the bone heal on top of it. So if you have an injury to the dura, and that dura is not repaired, or you didn't know, or just didn't need to get fixed because there's no leak, uh, there is a possibility that that fracture uh, doesn't really heal and it gets bigger as the time goes by. So the goal of therapy when we see some kind of fractures like that from our standpoint is protect the neurocapsule, make sure that there is no dural tear, and if there is one, we'll have to fix it, uh, and also restore the craniofacial contour. Going back to that boy, he actually does not have a posterior table fracture, so there's actually, his brain was actually pristine, but look at how big of a divot this is. So when you see him back in clinic in a week or two, when the swelling goes further down, he gonna ha he's gonna have a big divot there. So we'll talk to them about the potential of actually just popping that bone to make the contour look a little bit better. But look at this. This is a patient that was, as a very young child, had a skull, uh, an oral roof fracture, and there's a small little area of separation here. And as the patient grows, just four years later, look how much, uh, how much bigger this is. So this just emphasizes the importance of actually bringing the patient for follow-up every year. This, the, uh, the uh, pulsatility and the pressure of the brain just keeps this, keeps pushing. And when you see this patient in the office, they have a really pulsatile eye. So if you do have a patient that has history of something like that, uh, orbital roof fracture or any kind of fracture around that area, do a very thorough examination because the pediatrician is actually the one that usually sends to, to us. We, we don't see them for four years and then they come back with the tile eye. Like I said, treatment from our standpoint is fix what's broken if it's really creating a problem. Remember that up to six, seven or eight years of age, there's no frontal sinus, so there's no real cushion. So if you have an injury right away to the, street, to the, to the forehead, it's probably, uh, there's some intracranial component to it and the very important to routine follow-up of these patients for possibility of these growing skull fractures. This is another one. So this is a, a child, he was 11, and he was kicked by a horse. So was it a high impact or a low impact? High impact. High impact. He needed to have a CT scan on him. 
It's a little bit tricky to see, but the entire zygomatic maxillary complex, which is this part of the amelar area here, and his jaw was completely broken and rotated back. His orbit is not in the same position as the other side, and we have to fix this. But look how much swelling there is as well. So this is a laceration that was repaired. He comes back a week later so we can take him to the OR so we can fix the fractures. So usually it happens in older boys. A lot of kids, that little kids, uh, their, their mid-face is very small, so they really don't get hard in there. So check for malocclusion trismus. They, they're really tight. Cheek flattening, so you can do a little uh, bird's eye view and check if they have uh, the malar area here uh, similar to one to the other. Uh, and also, that segment of bone that we have uh, on the malar area is attached to the latter cantus of the eye. So if that's displaced up or down, it's, a, it's a, another way of thinking, oh, do we need to get a CT scan to make sure there's nothing major going on? Very rare to have a Lefort fracture, which is a fracture that goes through and through the jaw, the, the upper jaw, in little kids, because there's, sin there's not a lot of air in the sinus, so the bone is stronger. So we don't really worry too much about Lefort fractures in little kids. So the goal of therapy is to correct an ophthalmos. If there is any, the, the eye sinks in, uh, it's called an ophthalmos. Uh, restore occlusion if they have any problems with the bite, and also restore appearance. Most of these kids don't present like that one that I just showed. They usually have a little line, they have a couple millimeters displacement, and if a week later they don't have much for deformity, we don't do anything to that at all. For bigger fractures and displaced fractures, of course, we take them to the operating room, like this. Yeah, this was actually a kid as well, 16 year old. Another one, she was actually eight years old, uh, and she shows up to, um, to the ER, and her medial canti are pretty far apart. She has a nasal orbital ethmoid fracture, and this is an operative case, and as I said, I don't expect you're gonna be uh, getting that in your office, but you're probably gonna be getting something like this, which is uh, nasal bone fractures or nasal fractures. Another thing that is important to say is that we get CT scan results a lot from CT and says there's a maxillary, a frontal uh, process of the maxilla is broken. It's actually the extension of the nasal bones, so that doesn't really mean too much. So this is the nasal fracture, so the kid usually presents um, uh, to the pediatrician's office. There's nothing that we do right away with, this, with these fractures because they get so swollen that even if I put the bones in place where it's supposed to be, I end up put a splint, the spit becomes loose and the reduction is not there anymore. So if the patient shows up to the office, he does not need to come to the ER, they can come to the clinic, to our clinic within a week or so, so we can plan for a reduction. And we don't do anything open, we, actually, we do a closed reduction, we put a splint on. And we nasal deformity, like I said, you can have displacement of the medial part of the eyes as well as nasal deformity. Our goal is to restore appearance and correct the telecanthus. And the treatment can be closed reduction or open reduction for something bigger. This is a very important thing. This is something that is actually picked up by a lot of pediatricians and a lot of nurses that see the patient. When the patient has any kind of trauma to the face, check inside of their nose. It's a very quick examination that you can, see, you can potentially see some kind of look like blueberries. And this should be addressed sooner than later because if you, have, if you leave that blood in there for a long time, you, keep, you can have a septal perforation after that. So it's pretty easy. You can put some a little lidocaine spray or something, get a little oven blade or even a needle if it's been a while, and you can drain that. You can put a little packing of the nose if it's large or just leave it alone if it's not large. Then finally, the mandible. <laughs> which is uh, something that comes a lot from you. Uh, it's a kid that got any kind of trauma and they can be anywhere in the mandible. So condyle is this upper part here and then you have the ramus, angle, body, and parasymphysial or symphysial. So a kid comes like this in the office. He did come from a pediatrician's office. He was playing, I, remember, I think it was basketball or something like that. And he was hit in the face about three days before. Uh, and he just couldn't bite well. The most important uh, question that you ask here is that, do you feel that you're biting the way you're biting yesterday? And if they say no, this is a red flag. So then in this situation, you, s you have to send this patient to evaluation. Again, mandible fractures are not emergency either. You wait for the swelling to go down before you actually act on it. So this kid, get a C you get a CT scan, more, less for diagnosis, more for surgical planning. Usually you can see two fractures in the mandible, not one. Uh, so you can see one little fracture here and one little fracture right here. So patients can have malocclusion, 
drooling because they can't really close their, their mouth really well. Trismus, they can't, it's really tight. Numbness because it can uh, get hit their mental nerve. Decreased mouth opening and dental step off. So the goal of therapy is to restore occlusion. Having said that, in little kids, at first and the second group of kids that I talked about, up to 12 years of age, they are either in primary dentition or mixed dentition. And a lot of things are going to be tweaked by themselves. So you can accept a little bit of more occlusion because things are going to change and the occlusion is going to get better. So when you see them in clinic, all we have to do is make sure that they get some oral hygiene. If they're, a little young, if they're too young, no paradox because they can't, they can't spit but really good oral hygiene, a non-chew diet, so no gummy bears, uh, no steak, but they can eat pretty much anything that is non-chew, uh, and some pain medications, and then follow up within a week. So, mandible fracture is the most controversial and most extensive, so I try to make it simple, but it's really not simple. So if you have an incomplete, a green stick, means that it's not all the way through, a favorable, which is uh, something that is not against the muscles of the mastication, or minimal displacement, if the patient says, oh, I feel fine, the bite is the same, just soft diet and analgesics. If they're unfavorable, meaning they're against the muscles of a mastication, if they're moderately displaced, so abnormal bite, we can actually close their jaw with multiple things that I'm gonna show for just one to two weeks just to guide that bite. And then the worst one, of course, if it's, everything is all over the place, we will fix them um, uh, openly. So this is another way of just actually giving some, some um, comfort because they don't want to be opening and closing their mouth all the time. It's just this kid does not have a C-spine injury. It is just, just to keep his mouth uh, closed a little bit. Is it really needed? No, but it's comfortable. Or you can wrap their face. This is another way of doing it. If we're just going to keep them closed for a week or so, we can do some, uh, bend some orthodontic brackets and we can put them in uh, maximum mandibular fixation, which is just mouth shut for about a week or so. And here you can see he had a bit, really bad condylar fracture and his occlusion was perfect in two weeks because this straightens quite a bit. Overall, as I said, it's pretty broad and I hope you have questions about this because it's a lot of stuff to talk about. What is okay to, for the patient to actually be sent home uh, or sent home from your office and follow up with us within a week? Lacerations, simple lacerations that, you can, uh, that can be fixed or they were fixed before. Nasal fractures, any of the malar fractures that don't have any ocular or even, I should say, bite involvement, or mandible fractures as well. If, the, if there is there anything around the orbit, the patient should probably be brought to uh, the emergency department or uh, somewhere that they can, we can check their eye. Uh, Mid-face fractures that involve the, uh, the teeth. And if the mandible pain is uh, intolerable in regards to uh, keeping themselves hydrated or the pain with good pain control. And anybody that has pain facial fractures is multiple areas of the, the face that are broken. If they have an NOE, which is that central significant uh, deformity, and any concomitant injury, special neurological problems, they have to be admitted to the hospital. Key points, children are unique. So do, uh, if there is a question about how to treat that, you can always reach out to one of, the, uh, one of us on call and ask uh, questions. And instead of actually looking in an adult book, because that's not gonna give you the same, the correct answer. The younger the child, the earlier the follow up. Their bones heal super fast. So if you have a nasal fracture in a two year old and they're seeing two weeks later, too late. Can't do anything about that anymore. But if we have a 17 year old and we see them at 10 days, we should probably, she's actually probably a better thing because it's gonna be more it's going to be easier for us to put things back in place. For young children, we usually very conservative. Um, for older children, we treat them more like adults with open reduction. And there's a large gray area in between. That's why we're here, so we can send the patient to us uh, for follow-up. And then make sure that if the patient, your patient uh, had a uh, history of trauma, that there's a routine follow-up, paying attention to that specific area, their bite, their eye position, their symmetry, so we can address it if, the problem, if, if there's any problem.